Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Bless you. Leviticus 19. We'll go ahead and, and start there. Uh, and Leviticus 19 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, starting out right away, we'll, we'll go through this entire chapter, verse by verse, line by line. But who's speaking right here? The Lord. But he's using Moses as his vessel to speak through, correct? But Moses isn't speaking of his own. He's, he's speaking by way of the Lord. Same thing we saw with Amos, right? When Amos spoke, he always said, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. So Amos wasn't making up his own doctrine or his own scripture. God was directing him. And we see that, of course, happening here with Moses, all right? Leviticus 19, this, to set the stage, this is during the time of Moses and the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt as they're heading towards the promised land. All right? That's kind of set the stage there. So let's, 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 we'll go through this chapter and then we'll, we'll go into a little more detail here. Verse 3, Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it, and on the morrow, and if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. <laughs> abominable. <laughs> it shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off. From among his people. Verse 9. And when he, ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. As we go through this, I want you to sort of pick out the Ten Commandments that are in here because there'll be references to keeping the Sabbath, do not steal, do not kill. The Lord consistently repeats himself, not only in the Old Testament, but the Ten Commandments with the exception of keeping the Sabbath is also repeated in the New Testament. We saw an example of that in uh, 1 Timothy, but we'll, we'll go ahead. Um, where do we leave off? Verse 11, verse 12, and ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. That's a reference to which commandment? First one. Huh? Uh, the reference to which Ten Commandment, I should say. Well, you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall profane the name. Oh, I'm looking at thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Amen. That's right, Brother Michael. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. So, so you you see these as you as you're reading through these, right? Uh, verse thirteen: Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse uh, the deaf, nor uh, put a stumbling block before the blind. Thou shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer uh, among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's the world famous verse that you, even the non-believers uh, uh, talk about. But we'll, we'll get into more details later. Verse 19. Ye shall keep my statutes. Statutes. That's another uh, way of saying decree or, 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 or doctrine or something of that nature. Uh, now, coming up next is where the Leviticus 19 starts getting, for some people, a little weird. Because now we're getting into some laws that are not, or statutes that are not necessarily moral laws or ordinances. It says right here. Uh, ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let the cattle, thy cattle, gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment 
mingled in of linen and woolen come upon thee. And whosoever lies carnally with the woman that is a bondmaid, betrothed to an husband, and not at all redeemed, nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged, they shall not be put to death, because she was not free. Now, there's a lot of people who have problems with this section as well. And it's interesting that in the uh, other faith Bible versions, the NIV, the ESV, the TLB, the SUV, the HIV, the COVID, those other ones, they actually remove the, the part of the verse that says she shall be scourged. You won't find that in those other Bible versions. But everything that God has is put here for a reason. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Yes, sir? There's a quick question off the subject, but uh -huh. do, you, do you believe that the translation is inspired by the God? By God, so. Do I believe that the, the translations that you just referred to those other or translations to, or to the King James Version being translated into English is it inspired by God or I okay do I believe that the King James Bible is inspired by God the translation itself the translation to English to English yes. oh okay. I've I believe, let me see, how can I answer this? I, well, I believe that this is the infallible and inerrant word of God for English-speaking people. Okay. okay. That's what I believe. Yeah. But since yeah. you referenced the other versions, I just think of that. Okay. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Well, I, I guess when, when you said inspired, I, I guess the answer to that would be yes. But well, so, well, so the, point, the point is, if you believe this is God's word, yes, I do believe, believe that this is God's you word. Yes, God sent His only begotten Son to die on a cross for right. us. Right. Why is it so hard for people to believe that God can't give His English-speaking people or yes. any language yes. His word in their language? Yes. And hence, therefore, Satan and other people use these other versions, which you just said, right. is not it's not God's word because right. it's, it's they leave it's out God, parts. It's yeah. God. Or they add things to or it. Or they add things to it, right, and correct. And he says in Revelation, in the last book, don't do that. Right, he said he'll, he'll curse you if you add to his word. He'll, he'll so curse you if, it, he, if he... Oh, no, 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 that was a great question. That was a great question. I was, I was just trying to make sure I can answer that properly. <laughs> but no, no, that's, that's a great question. That's an uh, excellent question, actually. But, uh, yeah, um, I believe that this is the inerrant, infallible, preserved, Word of God for English-speaking people. Now, in a previous Sunday School lesson, we talked about um, that there are other translations like Spanish, Italian, French, and how those can be traced back to the original Old Testament and New Testament writings. We did a, a diagram of that uh, uh, some time ago. Some of y'all may remember that. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely we believe that this is the preserved Word of God because God is able to preserve it. If God is able to speak and create the entire universe, What's so hard about him preserving his, his word and then translating it to where uh, other people could appreciate it? We know that uh, when at the day of Pentecost, when uh, the Holy Ghost fell upon the uh, apostles and the people in the upper room and they began to speak with other tongues, everyone heard the marvelous works, the wonderful works of God in his own respective language. In so, the language they understood. And the language that they understood, exactly. And then as a result, 3,000 people got saved. So God has already demonstrated his ability to perfectly translate his, his word into other languages besides Hebrew and Aramaic and, 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 and Greek. And so um, if he could do it then, he can definitely do it, did it in 1611. He hasn't yeah. changed. Right, right, and God doesn't change. Amen. All right. Very good. Anyone else? Good question. Where do we leave off? 20. 20? Okay. Uh, Whosoever lives carnally with the woman that is a bond may be troth to an husband and not at all redeemed nor freedom given her, she shall be scourged. And uh, yeah, that's why I was saying that the other Bible versions actually leave that part out because it's hard to explain, right? If, if two are involved, why is only one getting, getting scourged? Okay, but, but we'll talk about that later. But sometimes if they can't explain stuff, they'll take it out. Just like, uh, just like last week, we talked about in the book of Amos that God repented 
when Amos uh, did an intercessory prayer. And a lot of these uh, other Bible versions, they remove anything that deals with God repenting. But they don't realize that repent is not always repent of your sins or something of that nature. That repent has other meanings. And so uh, they, they, they remove that. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 21. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for a trespass offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the Lord for his sin which he hath done and the sin which he hath done shall be forgiven him and when ye shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years shall it be uncircumcised unto you it shall not be eaten of but in the fourth year all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord with all, and in the fifth year you shall eat the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment nor observe times. Ye shall not round the corners of your head. This is another issue that that's some non-believers would challenge Christians on. That uh, thou shalt not mar the corners of thy beard. Thou shalt not Make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom, and the land become full of wickedness. Ye shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. And if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not vex him. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. We'll talk about that because not everybody who was a part of, of uh, God's people were necessarily Hebrew people. It was a mixed multitude. You had some Egyptians. You had some Ethiopians. You had Hittites. You even had, had Canaanites who uh, converted and uh, followed after the Lord. But we'll talk about that um, later on. Verse 35, ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight or in measure, just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hand shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. We talked about this last Sunday, I believe, talking about how uh, an, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Uh, Therefore, ye shall observe all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them. I am the Lord. Now, what's so important about Leviticus 19, and and we'll start from the top and and work our way through again, going back to verse 1. Leviticus 19 is a way of letting us know that it's not only important just to know of the Lord and believe and, and, and know who the Lord is, it is important, and to know that the Lord is holy, to know the character of the Lord, to know that he's holy, it is also important for us to be holy because God is holy. All right? So you say, well, how holy do I have to be? Well, how holy is God? When God gives us these instructions here in, in the very first two verses here, Leviticus 19, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. Why do I need to be holy, Lord? For, that's another way of saying, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. All right? If you got a holy God, then you need to have holy followers. Okay? It's not just enough just to say, okay, God's holy, and then I can do what I want to do. No. Be ye holy, for I am holy. But what happens next? God just doesn't say, okay, you all need to be holy. Go figure it out and be holy. He gives us specific instructions in his word that teaches us how we can be holy. That teaches us how we can be obedient. Okay? So he doesn't just say, it's just like when I first learned how to change the oil in my car. My my father didn't just say, Okay, son, go change the oil in the car. You know, my first time. No, he gave me instructions. And then on top of that, he demonstrated. 
That's what the Lord does for us. The Lord has given us instructions in his holy book on how to be like him. And then, because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he sent his son to be the perfect example. To say, here's the example. He lived the perfect, holy, sinless life. Not only that, he, he, he took on uh, our, our sins and bore our iniquities that, that we may be able to approach the throne of God because we, you know, our righteousness is as but filthy rags. Amen? Okay. So it is important for us uh, to understand that we serve a holy God, and because God is holy, he expects us to be holy. All right? Now, a lot of people will say... Um, Um, 1 John 4, 8 and 16, I believe, you'll find somewhere in both of those passages it will say God is love. All right? Which is true. Which is true. God is absolutely love. All right? And does God love you? Yes, he do. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world. Okay? But what a lot of people miss, and sometimes Christians miss this too, is that in Scripture, God talks about his holiness almost three times as much as he does his, his love. And as a matter of fact, God really doesn't expressly show or talk about his love for man until the fifth chapter of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy. When, now, the, the word love is mentioned in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, before you get to Deuteronomy. But those mentions about love, it's talking about how Abraham loved Sarah or how Isaac loved Rebecca or, or how Jacob loved Rachel. But God really doesn't express his love towards a man until uh, the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy. Okay? He's putting more of an effort on holiness. And, and why is this so important? Because we know that the character of God, we know that God is love. We know that God is love, but God is also holy. But God's love does not supersede God's holiness. All right? A lot of people will make excuses for their sins and say, well, I'm living this way, but that's okay. God loves me. Yeah. You know what? I cannot argue with you. I can't find in scripture for God doesn't love you. All right? But you're still going to go to hell if you do not recognize that you need a holy savior in order to get to God the Father. When we go out and, and soul win, like we went soul winning yesterday, we, we let people know, hey, yeah, God loves you, but God's love is not going to keep you out of hell. Amen. Because God cannot be in the presence of sin because he is holy. You got to think about this for a moment. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, uh, lama sabethany, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had, born, he had taken on the sins of the world. He had taken on my sin, everyone else's sin. God couldn't look upon that. And Jesus, Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because God is holy. He cannot be in the presence of sin. How do you think Satan? Why do you think Satan got kicked out? All right. And uh, Isaiah and also in Ezekiel, it talks about that, that Satan wanted to be higher than God. And then in the Gospels, Jesus said he saw uh, Satan kicked out of uh, heaven like lightning. God cannot be in the presence of sin and, and evil. So, yeah, God can love you, all right? But unless you come into a right relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ, and unless we're clothed in his righteousness and his holiness, we cannot ever approach God and be in heaven with God because God demands holiness, okay? So a lot of people that, you know, um, you have the LGBTQIA community, they'll be out front picketing in front of the church saying, uh, God is love. God, oh, they love this. They love this, these verses. God, you know, love, love your neighbor. We'll talk about that in Leviticus 19. You need to love me. Yeah, I can love you, but unless you get right with God, you're still going to hell. God's not going to save you because he is love. You keep yourself out of hell because you're, you're not holy. You're not holy enough to go. Romans 3.23 for all of come short of the glory of God. Okay, so it's important that people recognize that God is a holy God and he expects us to live holy. Ephesians uh, 1, I want you to turn to Ephesians 1 real quick. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Same as Christians who are not in, in right relationship with God or out of the will of God uses 
I'm covered by the blood. Yes, yes, yes. Now, yeah, now you can be you can be saved, but if if you've uh, backslidden or you think that you can just do what you want to do, now you've come in violation with. And we've talked about this in past Romans six one that says, "Shall we sin so that grace may abound?" God forbid. God doesn't expect you to to, to just go off and do what you want to do just because. Uh, you, you know he he you know you, that you're saved. You, he still has an expectation of you. And uh, hold your place here in Leviticus. I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. You got uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, um, Galatians, and then Ephesians. That's where I wanted you to go. Right? If you go to Philippians, you've gone too far to your right. Uh, Ephesians one. Ephesians 1 and uh, uh, 4. Look at Ephesians 1 and 4 for a moment. It says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy. Holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He expects us to be holy. All right. Now we're going to look at one other place real quick. And, and this is and another thing here. We're in an Old Testament, but we have to understand, too, the Old Testament is still just as important as the New Testament. There are some ordinances and laws that we no longer have to worry about anymore because they were done away with in the New Testament. Like, we don't have to burn a lamb on the altar as a sacrifice because Jesus was our lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And then there are other Old Testament ordinances that we do not follow. But anything that is not um, changed or modified in the New Testament is still applicable from the Old Testament. Okay, I gave the example, I think it was last Sunday, where uh, I said that nowhere in the New Testament can you find where it says you can't marry your sister. But the Old Testament says don't marry your sister. Okay, so that law, Old Testament law still applies even in the New Testament, even though the New Testament doesn't explicitly repeat it. Does that make sense? Okay, um, I want you to go to 1 Peter 1. I want you to look at one other thing. If you start from the back of your book, in the book of Revelation, you got Revelation, Jude, and then you got 3 John, 2 John, 1 John, then you got 2 Peter, you hit 1 Peter. If you wind up in James somewhere, you've gone too far to your left. <clears throat> 1 Peter 16 is what I'm looking for, but let's start at uh, 14. 1 Peter 14, it says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as... He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Well, who, well, who is Peter quoting right there? He's quoting the Lord from where? Leviticus 19. Because <laughs> that's the second verse of Leviticus 19. So you see how important the Old Testament scripture is. There, there are certain... Uh, moral laws that we are still obligated to uphold and which makes the Old Testament just as viable as the New Testament as I said before there are certain things we don't have to follow anymore I mean we can uh, have bacon for breakfast if we want to pork's not good for your body but it's still tasty you know because there are certain ordinances that were done away with in the Old Testament I mean you know in the New Testament that we no longer have to follow okay all right so uh, let's go back to Leviticus 19 for a moment. Any questions about that? So the Lord is speaking unto Moses, saying, Speaking to all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the, the Lord your God, am holy. The children of Israel, they're supposed to be representing God. And you got all of these pagan, heathen nations around them that's going to be doing a whole lot of stuff that, that God is going to tell them. They're doing a whole lot of stuff, but... These are things that I don't want you to do because you're separate. You're set apart. You are in the world, but not of the world. And that's the same for us as a church. Amen. We're in the world. We work daily jobs and things of that nature, but we do not have to be of the world. All right. We have to be holy. Okay. We have to be 
holy. We have to be separate. We have to be set apart from the rest of the world. And we need to understand uh, not only that God is love, according to 1 John 4, 8 and 16, but we also need to understand the character of God's holiness. Because when you have love separated from holiness, then what you have is you have love. You have, you have people loving things that God doesn't love. All right? Like a man liking a man. Okay. God doesn't love that. But the people, but the man, you know, the, the, the one man who likes the other man, he says, I'm in love. I'm in love with Jim or John or whoever. Okay. He says he's in love. But guess what? He's not walking in holiness. Because he is he, he, he's not walking in holiness. And once you separate holiness from love, now you're loving things that God doesn't love. Why? Because God is holy. God is holy and love. You're just love over here. Which is, that's debatable if it's really love, you know. Does that make sense? So that's the importance of holiness. Going back to Leviticus 19 now. Um, Ye shall fear every man his mother. Let's go to verse 3. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Now, this is interesting right here. I noticed that it actually puts mother in front of father here. Normally the man comes first. But maybe this is because of Mother's Day, right? So we're honoring mothers today, so, so mother comes first. You don't see this very often, but it, it happens to be here where it says, it actually puts mother before father. It says, ye sh shall fear every man his mother and, and his father. And that's very important um, that children honor and obey their parents. This is covered, of course, in Exodus, the 20th chapter. That's one of the commandments, right? That you should honor your mother and father. Amen. Okay, so but what that word fear right there, that fear doesn't necessarily mean a, 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 some type of abusive relationship where you're afraid for your parents to walk in the room or something of that nature, but it means a, a certain type of reverence. All right, when your child is about to do something, but then they think, would my mom and dad approve of this? Then you're doing pretty good in raising that child. That's what you want. Your, you want your child to think about what would mom and dad say if I did. More importantly, you want them to, to think about what would the Lord say. Okay, but that but you have to teach them that. Okay, so a lot of children, if they grow up uh, not having any respect in the home, then that translates outside the home, and then you have issues with school. Then you have issues later with police officers, right? Because it didn't start at home. Okay. And I'm going <laughs> to, they're not going to like this, but I'm, I'm going to put my, my wife and my sister-in-law on the spot. Has there ever been a time where you were going to wear something to church, but then you thought about, I'm not sure if my mom's going to approve of it? Okay, and I, I, I didn't really want to put them on the spot, but notice the nervous laughter. You notice how they're looking at their mom to make sure she, she still approves, okay? But that's the type of fear where, where, that the Lord is, is talking about. He's talking about a reverence, a fear where, you actually, where your children are actually thinking about, well, what will mom and dad say, okay? Instead of saying, I'm just going to do my own thing, all right? Now it says here in the latter part, it says, and keep my Sabbaths, I am the Lord your God. And the God repeats this, I believe it's in verse, where is that, verse 30, verse 30 of this same chapter. Verse 30 of this same, same chapter, God says, Ye shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Now, of course, we know that um, the New Testament church, that Jesus is our Sabbath and that we have our rest in him. Amen. And, I, and we've covered uh, this in, in times past, talking about uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, Hebrews uh, 7, 12, Colossians 2, 16, uh, talking, giving the different proof texts as to why uh, we don't recognize the Sabbath in the same way that the children of Israel did, okay, where, the, where it was a, a statute or an ordinance or a commandment that they had to do certain things, that they weren't supposed to do anything on the Sabbath. Okay, and then even Jesus in the next of the la the next to the last verse of Mark chapter two, Jesus reminds us. He says, "The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath." So, so we don't form our lifestyle around the Sabbath now. Okay, 
He said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's the next to the last verse in Mark, the second chapter. And we know that on the Sabbath day, well, that was one of the things that Jesus was accused of at least seven times in, in the Gospels. He was going through the field pulling corn on the Sabbath. Hey, you're working on, on the Sabbath. And Jesus had to explain to him, you know, uh, how, how the, the honoring the Sabbath was actually supposed to work. Okay, but during this time... Um, God is asking uh, uh, the children to keep the Sabbath. This is going to be one of the ones that doesn't necessarily apply to us. But once again, we have scripture to tell us. Oh, man, we're out of time. We didn't get through three verses. We have scripture today that tells us why we pick and choose what we do. We have scripture today that says you should not steal, you should not kill, because those things have even been repeated in the New Testament. But then we also have scripture that says you don't no longer have to give animal sacrifices. Okay. So we have scripture that explains to us why some things used to be done, but we don't do them anymore. Okay. The non-believer, the haters of God, they pick and choose as well. And oftentimes they will use Leviticus 19 as a way of challenging us and, and saying, oh, well, in Leviticus 19, it says you got to cut your beard a certain way. It says that you can't wear linen with, with cotton. What you got to say about that? That's because they lack understanding. They don't know the Bible. They don't know that there are certain things in the Bible that were said in the Old Testament that we don't have to do in the New Testament. But you see, they pick and choose. The non-believers pick and choose, but they don't know why. Right? Because the non-believer believes that murder is wrong. The non-believer believes that stealing is wrong. The non-believer uh, uh, believes that lying is wrong, well, as long as someone's lying to them, they may lie to somebody else is okay. But the non-believer also believes that homosexuality is okay. All right? Well, wait a minute. Why is stealing wrong, but homosexuality is okay? You see, they're, they're picking and choosing. But you see, we don't pick and choose because we go by what the Scripture says, and from the Scripture, we know why there are certain ordinances we no longer have to keep as far as the priest, the priesthood, and all that type of stuff. But the non-believers, they don't know. They just pick and choose because whatever fits their lifestyle. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Once you get done with this chapter, yes, sir. He, he, he tells you it's the balances. Yes. It's the balances that God created. Mm -hmm. And he says, in his holiness, a man shall not be with a man. Yes, yes. That's the part they don't understand is they don't get the holiness. They don't reverence God in the Holy Spirit way. Right. And they overlook it and they go, but... It fits. What, what do you mean? I mean, like, to them, in their mind, uh, it's okay for a man to be with a man because it's possible. Oh, oh. It's not right. It's yeah, yeah, not yeah. It's physically possible, and, but they don't, but like you said, they look at the love, they don't look at the holy. Okay. All right. But, but once yes, again, sir. but at the end of this, have you read it, the balances? Yeah, yeah. It tells you why it doesn't, I mean, like, water doesn't go with oil. Right, right, it doesn't so mix. Once you get through all the balances, you'll yes. see why they don't get it. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Very good, very good. We got to dismiss. Apologize we didn't get past three verses, <laughs> but we'll try to get, get through the rest of these uh, next Sunday. Do we have any other questions or comments before we dismiss? Appreciate the discussion today. And we appreciate, we appreciate our guests. <laughs> Hope they come back. Amen. So, any other questions, comments before we dismiss? Pick up, uh, read uh, Leviticus 19 again. If you want to have a Leviticus 19 sandwich, read Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. Uh, and then uh, um, it'll tie into Leviticus 19 as well. All right. But uh, scripture, very important, very pertinent, even, even uh, for us New Testament believers. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we uh, uh, pray, Lord, that uh, we've learned something today, Lord, as a result of uh, reading your word, Father, uh, for it's all good, both Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, we now ask, Lord, that as we go into the sanctuary, Father, that um, you'll bless the, the song service portion of the worship. Um, that you'll be with the congregation, Lord. And if there's anyone who doesn't know you for the pardon of his or her sin, Father, we just pray, Lord, that that individual will get saved today, Lord, and come into a right relationship with you, Father. For it's, it's not enough, Lord, just to, to, to love, Lord, but there has to be holiness tied to that love, as we learned today. And so, Father, we just pray, Father, that your will be done. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Amen. All right, all right, all right.